It's Radio Free 501C, the podcast of Rogue Tulips Consulting. I'm your host, Cecilia Sapp, and we're so excited to be back for Season 6 and continue bringing you outstanding ideas and thought leaders and different ways of thinking. So don't forget to subscribe because you're not going to want to miss any of it. This week, we're wrapping up AANHPI Month with my guest, Kevin Tuaga. It's his first time ever being on a podcast. We're going to be talking about the topic, being present in person for learning and leading. It's May 20th, 2024. Welcome to episode 241. Hey everybody, it's Monday, May 20th, and that means it's time for another episode of Radio Free 501C, brought to you by Rogue Tulips Consulting. I'm your host, Cecilia Sepp. I'm the principal and founder of Rogue Tulips, and thank you so much for joining us for this special episode where we wrap up our celebration of Asian American Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander Month, also known as AANHPI Month. And I'm so excited to have a first-time guest on my podcast and actually first time ever on a podcast. So this is a really unique experience. Kevin Chuaga, and he is going to talk with us about being present, which is so important in everything we do, but is being present for in-person learning opportunities and opportunities to lead. But before we jump into our topic, I would like to say good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to our global audience, wherever you may be. And thanks again for joining us. So as I mentioned, this is our wrap up episode of our celebration of AANHPI month. And I can't think of a better person to close us out or play us off the stage, however you would like to say it. But before we get into our topic, Kevin, it's so exciting that you are a first time ever podcast guest. So thank you for choosing uh, Radio Free 501C. Would you like to say hello to the audience and tell us a little about yourself? Well, first off, thank you, Cecilia, for having me. Um, I'm so excited to be on here. This is my first time ever, as you all heard, uh, being on a podcast. And so, yes, hi, welcome, everyone. Or may I say hello, everyone. My name is Kevin Tuaga. I am the Vice President of Education with Leading Age California in California. So um, who we are as far as an organization? Well, Leading Age California, we are a statewide association representing nonprofit senior living and care providers. We advocate for policies and practices that support quality care for older adults, offers resources and education to our members and promotes innovation in senior care services. And so with all of that said, I manage the fun aspect, if you will, um, for the association when it comes to education and how to deliver it and how our members receive that, whether it's a large scale event or something small as a um, intimate meeting, if you will. So very happy to be here. and Very happy to speak with you all. Oh, that's great. And that is a great background. Uh, I think a lot of people have heard of leading age. They're considered the nonprofit side of long-term care and elder care, as opposed to the other side, which is the guys who make a lot of money doing it. So, but people at leading age do it for the love uh, to help people. So it's great. I've been involved uh, in some coalitions with leading age and past jobs. So we have a Leading Age Maryland where I live too. So it's a great group. So if you guys want to learn more about Leading Age, they also have a national group you can check out or check out Kevin's group, which I'm sure is the most fun of all of them. I mean, I don't want to say most fun. I know the CEO over at Leading Age Maryland and she's a doll. Mm -hmm. Um, Hi, Allison. Shout out to Allison. So um, I'm sure they have a lot of fun there in Maryland as well. Yeah. Well, you know, Maryland is a fun state. We have crab cakes and all kinds of fun stuff like that. Uh, so lots of opportunities to be outside in nature, all kinds of fun here in Maryland. So, uh, but let's talk a little bit about, I, w- I want to talk a little bit actually before we jump into the in-person being present topic, which is important. I want to talk a little bit more about AANHPI month. And when you and I were prepping for this episode, we were, we were talking a little bit about, you know, some different stereotypes and and I had asked you, is your family name of Samoan descent? And, and you said, yes, it was. And we had some, a little bit of an interesting conversation about it because, uh, you know, I had mentioned, well, I know Dwayne The Rock Johnson is part Samoan. <laughs> so 
Um, what is it like uh, to be a Samoan, a person of Samoan descent, or a Samoan who has migrated to the mainland? What, what is that like uh, in America? Um, that's a great question. As far as what it's like, um, I don't know anything outside of um, America in terms of I was I'm a I'm a California boy. I was <laughs> born and raised here in California, and so. Um, you know, when you mention the rock, it's it's funny because majority of the known Samoans are, you know, either involved in sports or, you know, in this case, wrestling like the rock. Growing up in California and, you know, my siblings and I, we've just come across, you know, the various stereotypes where, you know, most of the time people will mistake who we are as, you know, a being of Latino descent or being Filipino, to this day, we still get that, which, you know, I find hilarious, but, you know, in the past, now thinking about it, um, there was a time where most people didn't know what the Samoa culture was or is. And so, you know, to provide feedback or some sort of education at the time when we were, you know, at a youthful age, we would just say, think of Hawaii, think of, you know, but, but more South. And so, <laughs> you know, that's, that's kind of the definition that we would give them just to, you know, give people an idea of who we were um, as people. Well, and you know, there is American Samoa mm -hmm. as well. So they're actually part of the United States. So um, I, I know you said you're California boy, uh, but do you happen to know, because I certainly do not, uh, is Samoa more than one island? Is it an archipelago? Is it a group of islands like Hawaii and Japan? Right. So there's multiple islands, in fact. And so there is an American Samoa, and then there's also Samoa or Western Samoa. Mm -hmm. And so both of my family or both of my parents are from the Western side. Mm -hmm. And so my dad is from um, a large island called Volu or Apia. Um, and then my mom is called, uh, or my mom is from an, an island called Savai. So, um, they're beautiful. Have I, I'm sure you're going to ask me if I've gone. No, I have not yet, <laughs> yet. but um, there eventually one of these days I will make my way out there to, you know, discover exactly my roots and where I've come from based on, you know, my parents. Yeah. Oh, well, that, that would be a fun trip either way. <laughs> I mean, if you're, if you're going for a journey of self-discovery, great. If you're just going to have a good time, I say go for it. Yeah, uh, it's I'm like, all about having a good time. Yeah, having fun. So this so before we get off the topic of Samoa, um I know you say your name Tuaga, but is there a more uh traditional way of saying your last name uh, yes. that's more Samoan? Yes. So the traditional way to pronounce my last name instead of Tuaga, it would be Tuanga. It sounds more vowels, like there's more, even more vowels. You know, there's uh, there's more enunciation and pronunciation on the vowels in my last name. So mm -hmm. yeah, I have two U's and two A's in there. And believe me, you'll hear every single one of them. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, and, you know, being a, a girl really out of Missouri, uh, there a little, sounds a little bit like a twang to me. You know, parts of Missouri, we have a little bit of a twang when we talk. Uh -huh. uh, especially Southern Missouri. So uh, that that's just really, I just think that's fascinating because we all have different ways of saying our name. Like my last name is Sepp, S-E-P-P. -P, uh -huh. And that's actually an Eastern European name. It's my husband's name. But in the South, it's S-A-P-P. -P. It's Sap. Oh, they spell sap. it differently. I'm not sure where that comes from, but, you know, frankly, I don't like being called a sap. So <laughs> I usually <laughs> correct people if I'm, you know, south of the Mason Dixon line. So no, I just think it's interesting. I love words. I'm a writer. I love history. I love studying different aspects of human beings and how we live and our culture. So I just like to hear, you know, how do people talk? Mm -hmm. You know, it's like that, that old story, the Tower of Babel. And how we all used to speak one language and then we were collaborating too much. And God said, wait a minute, they got to, they got to talk different languages now. <laughs> They're getting a little too ambitious. So <laughs> um, it's like, okay, that probably wasn't a good move on his part or her part, depending on who you are. Save the angry postcards. I'm not making a claim one way or the other, <laughs> like, you know, where God stands on gender. Um, 
Although I will say I did love Alanis Morissette's portrayal of God in uh, Dogma, the Kevin Smith movie. So it was a great movie. I love that movie. Yeah. <laughs> They're so funny. Um, but anyway, we digress. And obviously, Kevin and I have hit it off. And we're just going <laughs> to keep going down that rabbit hole. I want to bring it back, though, to our topic. Because being present is really very much a, an important thing, of course. Uh, and especially for individuals. And as individuals, we're all different. We, we've been talking this month as we celebrate AANHPI Month about celebrating those differences and getting to know each other. So when it comes to the fun stuff that you get to do, how do you encourage people to be present in the moment when they're learning or having that opportunity to have a leadership moment? Well, you know, for me, so my background has been marketing, education and events. And so being somebody that's, you know, picked up a few things and, you know, experience things behind the scenes, you know, what I can say is, you know, and attending in-person events as an, an Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander is incredibly significant when it comes to representation and leadership. And here's why. Firstly, being visible at these events challenges stereotypes and misconceptions. It's about showing the world the diversity within our communities and highlighting our contributions in various fields. So when people see us actively participating, it breaks down barriers and opens up new possibilities for everyone. You know, and I love that. I I think that is so important because we are not what we look like. No. There there is so much more behind that. You know, obviously I'm a white person and I am of Western European descent. So that's my story. That's my culture. Um, I did. I, I am uh, of Italian descent on my father's side. I actually did get to go to Italy once, but it was for vacation. I was not on any sort of journey of self discovery. <laughs> but uh, no, I loved it. Italy's great. Um, I really enjoyed it and kind of seeing how people live there. And uh, they just will talk to you. They don't care if you don't speak Italian, which I loved. They're very friendly, you know, and then I've had the opportunity to go to Budapest years ago and people in Hungary are very friendly and very outgoing and love to talk, you know, so they're, they're really fun. So finding the commonalities among us, I think is really important. And you're, and you're right, Kevin, just showing up right. and participating is really an important part of that, of educating people. And well, yeah, and I agree with that and even more so, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, um, that's okay. earlier, but I just, you know, like our presence at, you know, any events can inspire others within our own communities. Mm -hmm. So just by being visible in leadership positions or even just engaged in participants, we send a powerful message that success knows no boundaries. And it's about inspiring the next generation to dream big and pursue their goals and with confidence. And so just something that I've taken into, you know, when I go to conferences and I go to a lot, mm -hmm. um, I don't necessarily see that many, you know, representation of Pacific Islanders. I feel like most of the time it's, I would more than likely be the only one. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if, you know, should there be another person there that sees me or I see them, of course, I'm going to go and say hi and reach out. But, you know, it's, it's that it's just the showing up part. That's mm -hmm. the hardest part. But it goes a long way. It, you know, it, it, I, it does. I'm glad you said that. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about Pacific Island culture. And again, I know you're California boy, but I just <laughs> kind of want to get your take on that in a minute. But what you just said about being there, being seen, showing that you belong in that room and you do deserve a seat at that table, mm -hmm. that is so inspiring to other people. And of course, people who know me or listen to the podcast though i love star trek uh especially the original one uh the only other good one in my opinion was deep space nine again save the angry postcards because i know people don't like deep space nine because it didn't have a spaceship till the fourth season but anyway the original star trek what the goal of gene ronberry was was to show people from all around the world that looked different so nichelle nichols 
uh, was actually encouraged by Martin Luther King Jr. to stay on the show because simply seeing her as an officer inspired other people that looked like her. There was uh, Mr. Sulu, who was played by George Takai. He was from Japan. Well, we had just fought a war with Japan 20 years before, but here we are working together. You had a Russian, um, Mr. Chekhov, and, you know, who looked more like the sixth Beatle. <laughs> that could be a whole other podcast episode. But then he also had Mr. Spock, who actually was from a whole different planet. So you had all these different people working together. And and they all looked different, but they were all treated as part of the team. And, and they all had a role. They all belong there. So that that is a story. Humans love stories. Stories help us uh, teach each other and show each other what's possible. And so that's what I've always loved about that whole story of Star Trek. It's about what's possible and how people can keep growing and changing and learning. And I, and I just love that. So mm-hmm. to the cultures of Pacific Islands, every uh, people, you know, humans just do this, right? We do big bucket thinking. So, oh, it's Pacific mm-hmm. Islanders. Not realizing every Pacific Island is not the same. Right. They're, they're unique. So I don't know if you've ever thought about that, uh, what, you know, what the different cultures might be like, or, or do people ever make comments to you about, well, everybody lives in the Pacific is the same. I mean, is, is that something that people need to think more about? Well, I think what people need to think more about is who we are as people. Mm -hmm. And um, not necessarily where we come from, but how we were brought up. Mm -hmm. So I would like to say, in my humble opinion, that Samoans are humble. We um, and we're very friendly. Mm -hmm. Um, And you'll hear that about a majority of other Pacific Islander countries in the South Pacific or in Polynesian culture. Um, You know, we've had this upbringing of religion, um, having a religious affiliate attached to us. And so like, for example, you know, I grew up within the church as a kid um, and my dad was a pastor and, you know, he had a church for, I want to say four or five years. And so of course my siblings and I, you know, sometimes, you know, that old phrasing is the truth where the pastor's kids are the worst. (laughs) We may have been, but um, overall it's just, you know, we're, you know, we like to be thought of as being in the forefront of, you know, but we're also, we also take a, we're we're almost kind of like the version of we're the silent ones in the room, but we're also thinking about a lot. So like, you know, once when you ask for an opinion, it's going to be thought provoking and um, something that will you know, eventually gravitate or evolve into something that, you know, would gear towards more of like a successful goal, if that's what the conversation was about. But I, I, you know, ultimately, it's just, it's been our upbringing of, you know, being respectful, you know, of course, like, especially I'm in, I'm in a position where my members are caregivers, you know, Pacific Islanders, you know, majority of which you know, we we take care of our own. We take care of our parents. Uh, matter of fact, my parents live with me, and I um, I don't know if I would consider myself a caregiver, if you will, but um, they you know they are under my care, and um, in a majority of the Samoan culture is like that. You know, we we do take care of our people. We respect our elders. You know, to this day, and. You know, some say chivalry is dead, but that's just something that we've always been brought up in this culture of um, just being respectful and acknowledging, you know, those who are older and, um, and you know, just overall being respectful and just taking care of one another. I like that. And that's why it's so important for us to learn about each other and learn about our culture and where we come from. Because there's a lot of cultures like the Samoan culture and other Pacific Island cultures where they do respect their elders and they do care for them when they need help later in life. And, you know, I am an American, okay, born, bred, raised here. I listen to American music. I have American thoughts. I know American literature. I mean, I am an American. I am not from somewhere else. I'm well, unless you count Missouri, <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, but so, no, I love Missouri again, save the angry postcards, Missouri, love my home state. Um, but 
in the United States, we have an obsession with youth. You know, um, people think it's a compliment to say to someone, you look so young. Mm -hmm. You know, um, some people don't say that so much anymore. They just say, well, you look really good. I can't believe you're as old as you are. Uh, yeah, because there are rude people that ask you how old you are, whatever. <laughs> but it's like, oh, really? You don't look it. And it's like, well, what does that look like? It's, you know, it's it's like aging. This was an interesting thing when I was working in long-term care years ago. And I learned that, wow, outside the United States, they accept the fact that people age differently. Mm -hmm. So uh, all 65-year-olds are not the same. All 80-year-olds are not the same. And, and I read a really interesting quote, and I wish I could remember who said it, but it's not me. I'm quoting someone else. They said, there are some 65-year-olds that are just getting started and 35-year-olds who are done physically. I mean, they're just done. So it's, it's, so again, you know, the aging process is so different. And being able to have these different options like leading age educates people about that. And I am, I am also in a caregiver type situation like you and that uh, my elderly mother-in-law who just turned 88 in April. So happy birthday, mom-in-law. Happy birthday. Uh, yeah. She lives in an assisted living community now, not too far from us. And, you know, so she lives, you know, there and she has made a lot of good friends there and the staff there is wonderful. She's very comfortable there. It's not the same as having her own house, but you know, she's in a community and she's cared for, but we still go visit her every week. We make sure she has everything she needs. We take her to her doctor appointments and things like that. And we're happy to do it because she has done so much for so many people in her life. And we're, we're glad that we can help her when she needs it. So I think, you know, having those kind of conversations because we're all going to get older, you know, there's no going back. Uh, I think that's an important thing. I I, I agree with you. And what's interesting is, you know, as I'm talking about my upbringing and then of course, um, you know, my, who I represent in terms of like what I do for work, you know, it's, it's, I feel like it's come full circle in a sense where I'm in this caregiving industry and, um, you know, I just, I, I'm so inspired by, you know, my members, you know, these nonprofit retirement communities throughout California. And they, you know, we were talking, you were talking earlier about, you know, aging and, you know, we're, we're obviously against, you know, any sort of anti-aging um, anything in that <laughs> realm. And so, you know, one of our members uh, in California, they, they're Escaton and they, you know, their slogan is age is beautiful. And so it's, and you should see some of their advertisements that they do. It's phenomenal, but you know, it is beautiful regardless of where you're at in terms of age. Um, it is. And, you know, as you mentioned before, we are getting older. People do get older. So there's no shame in that. There really isn't. And, and I just have to say my mother-in-law looks so good. Uh -huh. <laughs> so do my parents. My yeah. parents are in their, you know, seventies, mid seventies and, you know, still able-bodied um, for the most part and they they look good I'd like to think they look good yeah and it's just you know and I think and I and I hate that saying you know looks good for their age mm -hmm. you know because I'm just gonna say this and go ahead and send in the angry postcards I've seen a <laughs> lot of ugly 20 year olds you know I'm just saying <laughs> it's like they're out there <laughs> yes they are <laughs> so ugly is not an age <laughs> so that is so fun um so because of course like I always say I crack me up I think I'm hysterical so anyway um but I think when it comes to what are the you know the activities that the ASA group a an HPI group that is part of a it's in ASAE it's one of our communities there I know they're doing a lot of activities, this this great uh, activity with podcast uh -huh. series this month. Uh, I'm not the only podcaster who's participating. I know there's a new LinkedIn group that just launched this month. There's okay. also some events coming up at ASAE uh -huh. annual meeting in August. So are there any other uh, tidbits uh, about the activities that you would like to share? I think the only other tidbits would be mainly is to follow the group um, that we've created 
um, where you can find all those details and anything up and coming. What I'm excited for is for the annual meeting, the ASAE, oh, I'm sorry, ASAE annual meeting that'll be in Cleveland, Cleveland. Yeah. in August. And so I'm looking forward to seeing the council members and, you know, figure out exactly how to continue to grow the outreach. And I'm hoping based on the efforts that we're currently making on social media, that we'll get a response and that, you know, the rep the representation will be there. You know, and I, and I hope so. I think that uh, really the Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander community is overlooked in a lot of ways. And maybe it's because they do tend to be cultures that are more quiet. Mm -hmm. You know, Western civilization is very loud, uh, <laughs> you know, kind of, uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. And, and yeah. And it's like, sometimes I think it's too loud too. And I'm from here. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but you can do made a really good comparison between that when he was on earlier this month and he talked about, and I'd love to hear what you think about this, Kevin. Uh, so he talked about Western civilization versus like Asian civilization. He said, you can really see that in the British parliament. Yeah. because they're so busy trying to make a point, be witty, yell at each other, wave their hands around. Sometimes they get in fist fights. Uh, whereas like in Asian culture, that doesn't happen because everybody is very much about the group and being respectful and being a little quiet. So do you see that as well? Uh, and I mean, cause I thought that was a great example. I do. Um, especially within my own community, you know, we, tend to, you know, as I mentioned before, we tend to be more quiet um, and only speak up when, you know, there's something profound or there's, you know, a thought that we feel that, you know, could be of importance that we would want to share. Um, I think what I also find interesting too is amongst the, amongst our community, there's, you know, a great network. However, I feel, and of course this is the AA and HPI goal or council goal is to further that outreach is, you know, the network and um, the amount of opportunities there are within that network. And so, you know, just going back to from, you know, an event standpoint is, you know, building connections with peers, mentors, any collaborators, potential collaborators, you know, can lead to new opportunities and avenues for growth and you know, these relationships, they're essential uh, for not only just personal development, but also professional as well. And so that's what I think what I feel like, you know, within our AA and HPI community, we, we've done very well at. And I'm and I know that it's the goal is to continue uh, is to continue to further push that out. Well, and I think I think that's a great goal. And I'm very supportive of that. Uh, and if there's anything that I or anyone else can do to help promote that goal, you know, please let me know. Um, I know that you're kind of new to the council for mm -hmm. AA and HPI, but mm -hmm. do you happen to know how long that council has been in place? You know what? I do not, but mm -hmm. I want to say it's probably been around for more than three years. Okay. Um, I've been involved with ASAE for, I'm going on a little over 10 years. Mm -hmm. And so when I was approached by one of my colleagues to join the council, you know, I, to be honest with you, at first, I didn't even know one existed. So as soon as I heard about it, of course, I jumped at the chance. I was so excited and thrilled. And, you know, now I'm involved in, you know, the monthly calls and, you know, doing my part in regards to outreach. And so it's just been it's a great network. And, you know, I really do hope that more join. And again, you don't have to be of AA and HPI descent. You can, you can still be part of the group or the network. Um, yeah, it's just, it's a lot of thought leaders that are involved within, you know, this council. And I'm just truly ecstatic to be, you know, within their presence. I love that. So do you know how big your council is? Because like you, let me preface that question. Like you, I did not know there was a council. I uh -huh. knew there was a group, but I didn't know there was actually a leadership council, which is awesome. Very happy to hear that. Mm -hmm. uh, so is there, you know, how big is that council? 
Well, from what I've seen based on the Zoom calls, uh, <laughs> I want to say it's it's gotten larger over time, but I want to, I want to say maybe close to about seven, 17 to 20 individuals. Awesome. Yeah. That's great. That's great. That That's, I think, kind of the typical size of an ASAE council. But again, like you said, a lot of people may not even be aware of it. So, But then also think about just, you know, the amount of cultures within the AA and HPI community and how large this group can go. And I think mm -hmm. that that's exactly what the council's goal is, is to involve those, you know, other communities and raise their voices as well. Oh, that would be awesome. So, you know, we're getting near the end of the episode, um, but there's a couple other questions I want to make sure we cover. So, as I mentioned, this is our fourth and, and last episode for this year anyway, for May celebrating AANHPI month. But how can we continue to have awareness of what this important group does for not just nonprofit management, but just for our society overall. We'll definitely follow the group that's on LinkedIn um, to be more involved and know uh, and, and find out what's in the know. And then, you know, on the rep representation side, it's just actively participating in these in-person events. You know, they help us also develop our leadership skills. And whether it's you're speaking on a panel or a podcast, <laughs> leading workshops or organizing community initiatives, you know, these experiences are invaluable. And, you know, ultimately, you know, they build confidence, communication skills and strategic thinking, you know, all of which are, you know, effective for leadership. And that's kind of where, you know, we want our council, we want, the folks that are within this group is, you know, we see them all as leadership and we want to elevate their voices and their skills to be in those leadership platforms and have a seat at the table as well. So is there also a collaborate community for AANHPI? There is. And so I want to say you may have to be an ASAE member in order to um, participate in the collaboration online, but it's a very valuable tool and you can also learn more about what's happening. And in case you didn't know of a meeting or forgot about a meeting that's coming up, believe me, Wendy, or somebody will let you know. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. And, and you do have to be an ASA member yes. to access anything and collaborate. Uh, I'm very active with the consultant community on collaborate. Oh, okay. So uh, we don't have a council. Uh, we're just kind of self leading. <laughs> we just well, I'm also on the meetings and events council for ASAE. So oh, cool. um, that's, that's an engaging group as well. So I bet that's a lot of fun. You probably enjoy that one. It's a lot of fun. It's a lot of work, you know, mm -hmm. um, it's not all fun and games. Believe me, there's a lot of behind the scenes and a lot of attention to detail that plays into it. That's true. Yeah. I was on two councils uh, at ASAE earlier in my career. I was on the communication council uh -huh. And I was on the Component Relations Council. So it, it is a lot of work in the background, uh, depending on what your group is doing. So uh, it's it's really, now I think it's a good experience to do that. If you can get on, there's just, there's not a lot of openings, uh, unfortunately. So sometimes, you know, you got to wait to have the opportunity to get on. So, you know, if you're out there, if you're an ASAE member and you've mm -hmm. been trying to get on a committee or a council, and you haven't had that chance yet. It's frustrating, but I say, you know, please keep applying if you're really interested because it is a worthwhile experience and it just might take you some time to get get an open seat. So don't give up. Um, and it's, and a lot of, it's, a, it's a welcoming network of people. Yeah. You know, these, these, these people that, you know, are volunteering uh, their time, you know, that means that they care about it. They mm -hmm. care about the goals and the mission driven, you know, statements that they're representing. And so, you know, I encourage everyone if they can to join. That's yes. Well said. Thank you, Kevin. That's, that was great. And we, we, I think sort of skirted around our actual topic, but I think we made some good points on it <laughs> on, because what you were just saying about your council experience, you're in person, you're engaging. Yep. And you're leading. So I think that's that's a great example of that. So 
Now, but I always like to ask my guests before I wrap up the episode, what is the one thought you would like the audience to take away today? And if they wanted to reach out to you and talk more, how could they get in touch? Well, one thing that I would like, you know, given based on what I've shared, you know, um, from an event standpoint is, you know, showing up to in-person events as somebody from an AANHPI um, background is not just about personal advancement, it's also about advancing the visibility, representation, and leadership of our entire community. So I, again, I encourage those, you know, I want to say, come out, come out wherever you are and, <laughs> and, and attend these events. But um, if for those that want to um, reach out or follow me, I'm on uh, LinkedIn and you can look me up under my full name, Kevin Tuaga, or um, or the letter K and my last name. I know it took me probably like a day for me to figure out what that was going to be, but it ended up being my first initial and last name. So there you have it. Thanks Great. So well, <laughs> I love it. Well, thank you so much. This has been a wonderful conversation. And again, I want to thank you and the rest of the AANHPI Council at ASAE for inviting Radio Free 501C to partner with you on promoting this important month. And it's been wonderful. And I've just had a great time meeting everyone. Great. Thank you so much, Sila. May I say one more thing? Yes. It's also considered older older adult month as well in, in the month of May as well. So Ooh. happy older adult to anybody that considers themselves older adults. I guess it depends on what is your <laughs> age break. <laughs> <laughs> You know, as a don't trust anyone over 35 or, you know. Well, I guess I can't be trusted then. There no, we go. No, I, well, I couldn't be trusted before I was 35. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> That's been so much fun. Everyone who has uh, participated in AANHPI Month here on Radio Free 501C and all the other people, other podcast hosts who have hosted people from this group. Uh, thanks, everyone, for doing it. And to our audience, uh, thank you for listening uh, and please learn more about what this important group does, not just for the nonprofit management profession and ASAE, but throughout our whole society. We have to go rogue for now, but we will be back the first week of June. We're taking Memorial Day off. We'll be back the first week of June with another exciting episode. So don't forget to subscribe or follow us on your favorite podcast platform. If you'd like to learn more about Rogue Tulips Consulting and how we can help your organization bloom outside the box, check out our new website. It has chock full of information about us and you can learn also about our Rogue Tulips education program if you're getting ready for the CAE exam or need to get that all important ethics renewal credit for renewing your certification. That's roguetulips.com. On behalf of Kevin and myself, Thanks for joining us and we'll see you next time. See you next time. <laughs>